welcome everybody to um, our Creative Futures program. Uh, today is session four. Uh, for those of you who haven't been before, um, I'm, I'm Joe, uh, my colleague Jess, who you can see on screen as well. Um, so we're, we're the team behind the project um, working on for study higher. Uh, and using Zoom today, um, we've got the chat function. So if um, Sophie who, and Toby, who are going to be presenting to you, um, if they ask you any questions, just type them in the chat, your answers, or if you've got any questions for Sophie or Toby, type them in there. We're also going to be using the poll function, which for those of you who've been to previous sessions with us, we essentially launch a poll and you can just, it's multiple choice and you can tick which box is relevant and then we'll show you the answers. Um, so those are the two things that we're using on webinar today. You'll see Ray's hand, but we're not gonna use that. I'll hand you over to Jess now. Awesome. Yeah, for those of you who might not have come to a webinar before or might not have heard about Study Hire, um, we are a partnership of different colleges and universities from across Swindon, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire. And our job is to work with secondary school students to put on different events and activities like Creative Futures to help you make informed decisions about your future. Um, so we are delighted this evening to be joined by Toby and Sophie from Sirencester College. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Toby now. Oh, well, uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Toby Carter. I work for Sirencester College. So uh, I guess I can probably fly the flag for Sirencester for a couple of minutes. So we've got a very unique uh, project in uh, creative apprenticeships. So if you were ever thinking about um, moving on in Korea, or taking your next steps, college, university, apprenticeships, uh, those kind of things, this could be uh, um, a viable avenue to go down. Um, but we generally, we've got a, a range of apprenticeships at the college, uh, not just creative, but my bag and Sophie's bag is creative ones. So um, we seem to be quite niche in that front, especially in this area. There's not many people doing it in the south, sort of southwest. There's more coming through, but still we're quite we're one of the sort of uh, leaders in doing these uh, in the local area. So if you were maybe a young person thinking about joining a um, joining the media industry or you fancy like maybe making or uh, getting into the video industry, that's a classic one. Um, this is kind of something that you might want to think about doing. So <clears throat> I guess the point about an apprenticeship is you would be earning and learning and you would be given some fantastic opportunities to be injected directly into um, some wonderful employers who are working in the industry uh, without going through maybe university which can be sometimes a little bit longer um, but it's still a viable platform. So uh, I've got a really tiny kind of slideshow to show you um, uh, so if you just give me uh, just uh, one second I'll see if I can do a screen share and you can you can see my see my screen. Uh, so I've just put together a really, a really, really simple thing. So I'll be as quick as possible with it. So we do creative apprenticeships at Siren Sister College. And then so um, classic thing, take it back to basics. So what is an apprenticeship? So an apprenticeship is a full time job with training. So the idea is you do your job and training. So you'd have blended on and off the job training that provides individuals with the skills they need for their chosen career whilst you're earning a wage. That's the big thing. So apprenticeships are available across a wide range of industry sectors and are an excellent way of gaining a national recognised apprenticeship skills, knowledge and behaviours uh, award while gaining real work experience. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll explain it a, a little bit more in a second. And then and so anyone living in England over the age of 16 uh, who has completed some year 11 secondary school and who wants to work in a full time job can apply for uh, an apprenticeship. So you can do an apprenticeship after your GCSEs, you can do it after your A-levels, um, you can even do it when you're older. We've had some uh, people come through in older ages th these days, but yes, there is a definite push for 16 to 18s to be taken forward the project. Um, so yeah, uh, if it helps paint some pictures, a lot of apprenticeships are based on a level three platform, which would be an A-level. So maybe in your mind, you can think about it being a, um, a similar vehicle to go into college or maybe even a similar vehicle definitely a similar vehicle to go into university and obviously it could put you straight into the world of work 
And then what do we do? So I'm um, not too much uh, flashy images and stuff. I'll just kind of talk it through, really. So we do creative apprenticeships. So the industry, what is a creative apprenticeship? So it's being able to stand out is vital for strong marketing strategy. And digital media, that's kind of what we do, helps uh, that happen by telling stories, selling products, promoting messages and building brands. So things like high quality video, multimedia, virtual effects, uh, photography, digital comms and audio content uh, are essential elements of vibrant storytelling and captivating production. So that's the kind of stuff that most apprentices seem to get involved with. So we've got a unique programme in the creative sector. We specialize, seem to specialise predominantly, but not always, in film, TV and media. That seems to be the big stuff. Uh, they're a fantastic entry point into the creative industry and place you directly in the business. That's kind of what you probably don't get with going to university, uh, meaning you get to work on live, real, live, actual live uh, projects in the industry that you'd like to have thought of. And the main thing is you get paid at the same time, so you'd be learning and earning. And then, uh, yeah, so apprenticeships essentially has provided many success stories for school leavers. I can come on to that in a second. And yeah, my, the strap line, just remember you're earning and learning. So you get paid and you get to work in the industry that you that you choose. And then the sectors you could work in, you could work in um, broadcast and TV. So uh, 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 yeah, so if you want to work on in TV, radio, broadcast, that kind of thing. So classic, just turn the telly on, you'd be working in those kind of industries. Uh, PR and communications. So if you were into social media, which lots of people seem to be these days, Maybe you're into public relations, which is about controlling and manipulating the news as needed, uh, communicating messages or building brands. So all those nice brands you see in the shops, they're crafted by lots of people in, in communication roles around uh, the country. There's VFX and visual effects uh, apprenticeships out there. And that sector is, um, is actually quite desperate for uh, young and new talent. So if anybody out there would ever think about moving into special effects for films, uh, for TV, I know there is a, a, a big shortage for people doing that. Uh, you've got arts and events, which Sophie may be able to um, say a few words about. That's her kind of background really. have been um, engaging talent in events industry and in the arts, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got content creation, which is a bit wide platform and probably the most picked up, which is things like photography, making sort of videos for companies, making sort of graphics for companies, that kind of stuff. So there's a few different sectors there you could work in. And then super quick, so jobs you could kind of do. Uh, so broadcasting TV, maybe you're working on a production assistant, maybe you're helping out on a program. So last production assistant I knew moved on to EastEnders after she finished her apprenticeship, so she went to work for EastEnders. You could work as a runner, which is uh, working in TV studios, or you could work for an edit assistant. So I know of numerous uh, ex-apprentices who are now working as edit assistants at the BBC, and they are editing in Bristol on all of the uh, wildlife programmes. So that's kind of what they're doing. And then you've got things like in the PR and comms stream, you, you could be maybe a social media manager. So maybe you could control and manipulate social media. You could be a PR exec, which sounds posh, but maybe it's about writing and creating stories as needed. Or you could be maybe a creative writer. So that seems to be a new one, which is like blogging and um, creating uh, written text online, because I'm sure everybody is reading still online with the advent of social media. And then the VFX and visual effects. So that's very unique, but maybe you might go in as a junior artist or 3D artist, so you'd be making small models um, for um, TV programmes, uh, maybe kids cartoons, they're a big 3D thing, or maybe uh, if you're lucky you might work on some sort of big film or something. And then there's some bits there that Soph will be able to, to nail a bit better than me, but kind of events and museums and community, community coordinators etc in the arts and events sector and then in content creation which is kind of my background you've got photographer videographer graphic designer kind of media assistant maybe you're making movies and, and pictures and stuff for a business so uh last couple of bits um where can you find them yep so once you've if you're over 16 and you're ready you kind of maybe finish your gcse you could get you could get search in so 
I mean, most people can just type it into Google these days. You can just type in apprenticeships into Google and it'll get you where you need to go. But there's two links. You can come to us direct. We've got the advertised roles direct. And if you can, you can ring the college and say, could I have some advice? I'd quite like to go in this direction. Is there any jobs? Um, or you can check the Gov website, which is the classic thing. And then the last thing, I've got a video. I'm not quite sure videos play very well. Um, so maybe I can get some feedback on that. But what I might do is I might just put that video link in the chat or I might offer it out as a as an extra thing after the, the event. We can email it out afterwards, Toby. Yeah. There you go, Joe. We'll email that out. It's only a three minute video. It's made by an ex apprentice. So maybe in a quiet moment when we're finished, people can check it out and see see how he sort of started in the industry. So maybe we can do that as a bit of a a bit of a follow up, I suppose. Um, and that's it, really. Yeah, that's 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 my sort of little presentation over, I suppose. Great. Thank you, Toby. Are you going to be around at the end for when we ask the questions? Yeah, yeah I'll stay around as needed to help Sophie if necessary. I'm okay, here. Thank as, you. As, so as, yeah, as... if anybody's got any questions, so whilst we're swapping over screens, yeah, if anybody's got any questions, pop them in the chat box and we'll, we'll answer them at the end of um, Sophie's presentation. We'll hand over to you now, Sophie, if you're ready. Thanks, Joe. I am just sorting out the screen. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's just check. You can all see event production there on the screen. Amazing. Okay. So, hello. Nice to, nice to have you join me this evening. Um, so, oh, let's get the... Okay, I have to go scrolly. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So I'm Soph, um, pronouns are she, her. My job title is um, it's kind of a funny one, really. Um, I'm an assistant producer in, I guess, what you call the experiential industry, um, because the experiential industry covers a range of things from marketing, um, gaming, entertainment, rides, theme parks, um, festivals um it's a lot about live entertainment really a lot of kind of um, event stuff generally at the moment it's getting bundled into experiences so um and i um so i work with a lot of um uh, creative producers and directors in putting on some experiences generally um in the broadest sense that i can describe it i'm also an educator in entrepreneurship and the creative sector i've been working with siren sester college for a few years now and i've been working with their apprentices um i've been doing some mentoring with them as well um and um my experience um has been i'm going to be talking a lot today about events but my experience started out in theatre, went over to film, and then finally I've ended up in kind of this events industry, which does actually still branch into different creative sectors as well, because you can have events in pretty much anything. Okay, so I have done lots of different types of events. So when we think of events, I know we think of things like award ceremonies, weddings, corporate functions, uh, launches, dinners. I've done all of these. I've done the ones that you probably have come to mind, but my niche has become some things that are a bit more, slightly more weird and wonderful. And so I'm going to talk a lot about this today because um, it's a route that uh, you may not have considered. You may have. You're wondering how on earth does how on earth do these weird things happen? Um, so yes, you, you can apply everything I'm talking to in terms of the more traditional style of events, um, corporate functions, uh, weddings. All of this still applies because um, they all of the skills are completely transferable. Um, but most recently, I've been working on some strange things that I would love to share with you. So I'm going to start by attempting to show a clip with my first one. Oh, actually, I'll point out the picture. Bottom left picture is the one I'm going to start with. This is my first um, first big job at events. Um, as you can see down there, there is a zombie, and that is me in the background. This is for an event called 2.8 Hours Later. Um, I'm just going to get a little video playing whilst I talk about it. And don't worry, it's not a scary video. There's, it, I mean, it's technically about zombies, but you don't really see much. It's fine. Um, where are we? Okay. 
How do I share? Does anyone know how I share a tab? I managed to do it before. Can't seem to do it now. Oh, uh, uh, so if I'm not quite sure you can share a tab, I'd share this my whole screen. Um, oh, okay, so just go, go to I just say shared screen and then it just shows your whole screen, so. Fine, yeah. I'll do that, okay. Thanks for the assistance. Let's try this. There we go. So this was 2.8 hours later. This was a cross city zombie chase game that um, was around, uh, its last tour was in 2015. So it's a few years ago now, uh, but it went uh, across multiple cities um, in the UK. Generally kind of how it worked was, it was just a game of tag essentially with multiple locations across a three mile radius of a city. And it would take you roughly 2.8 hours to complete. You get chased by zombies, there would be road closures, um, and this could be through um, through some roads, this could be through some empty locations such as uh, shopping malls, or we had some uh, quite derelict warehouses that we used as well. Um, as you can see here, there's some people being chased, standard sort of affair that you get with this sort of game. At the end, they end up at a warehouse where there is a zombie disco, a kind of party that would happen. Um, and you would get scanned and if they found that you had um <laughs> if you i'm just gonna pause this um if you were marked with uv that meant the zombie had tagged you because the zombies had little uv pens on them so if you got tagged you would glow when they scanned you to come to the warehouse which meant you're infected so you would then get turned into a zombie yourself you join the disco and you've got humans versus zombies and then you basically have a bit of a party at the disco um, so that is what I did for quite a few years. Um, so I started out, um, and I, I think what's handy with each of these ones is I'll tell you how I got in it. I got in this one um, by absolute chance because someone who was meant to be one of the zone managers, which is effectively like a stage manager, uh, dropped out um, last minute. And because I had pestered them being like, I, I want to get involved, I want to get involved. And they go, oh, Sophie was right at the top of the inbox, just happened to be there for a last minute um, cancellation. Great, I was in. Um, I did my first so managing and I gave it my absolute all. And then they brought me back for every single game from there on in to then zone manage. Eventually I became assistant director of the show. Eventually I became director of the show um, after about three years. So that those things can happen. You just pester to be at the bottom of the ladder as soon as there's someone that drops out, boom, you're in. During my time here, I guess I experienced a mixture of things um, such as uh, how to deal with road closures and working with the council, um, how to recruit volunteers, because all of the zombies we'd have for the game, they were all volunteers. We recruit about 200 people per city, which is quite a lot of work. Um, deal, um, dealt with um, people having lots of multiple injuries with games like this. Anything you do where people are running, so sports events, games events, anywhere anyone's going to fling themselves somewhere, there's going to be injuries. Um, and touring. Touring is um, a big part of events um, that you could get part of. It's really fun. It's really hard work touring as well because you'll be probably in a little mini bus together crashing on different hotels. So I did this for a few years as well. I'm not sure if I could do it again now. I'm too old. <laughs> but it's definitely worth doing at some point if, if that kind of excites you. Cool, okay. Um, oh, why did I close that? I need to just go to the other video. Okay, next one I'm gonna show you <laughs> um, is actually one that's quite recent now. So that was what I started off. My first big gig, I guess, in events was 2.8. Um, now I'm gonna show you the one I've been working on for the past four years. And that is a festival called Boomtown um, and they are a 66,000 capacity festival um, that takes place in Winchester. This is the after movie from chapter 11, so that after movie from the 2019 festival. Um, as we are all probably aware, uh, festivals have 
not been happening for the past year. And yesterday, we unfortunately did have to announce that this year's one has also been uh, cancelled. Um, and because um, we were unable to get um, insurance, which is the sad reality for uh, the festival world right now. So it's kind of a bit of a weird elephant in the room to be talking about events when they're not really running right now. But, you know, post COVID is coming. Um, I'm feeling very hopeful. Um, so I work in the creative department specifically at Boomtown. So I focus on bringing in um, uh, looking for artists, performers, um, lots of kind of collectives, creative collectives that can work together to create something amazing for the festival. So I look for them, I look for lots of new collectives, and once they're in, I try and develop them and um, be able to improve their offering every single year. Um, so it's really exciting that I get to kind of help be part of that. We have these kind of crazy big shows that we have. Um, as you can see, there's loads of pyrotechnics. Um, some of the shows are a bit more small scale and a bit more intimate. It really ranges at Boomtown because there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of space, a lot of things for me to fill it with quite epic stuff. Um, my time here, I've experienced hurricanes coming through a festival. I've been on a festival site for a long period of time where you sleep in a caravan and um, you work really, really long days, don't get much sleep probably multiple days with pretty much no sleep. So it is really, really hard work working on a festival site. There's lots of meltdowns. There's, um, uh, it's, it's just, it's tough. It's really tough because everybody's very tired. It is very, very stressful, but it is immensely worth it um, because we truly believe we're putting on the best show in the world and there's nothing better than that feeling of um, knowing or putting on something that is gonna, um, be something that's people going to remember for the rest of their lives. Uh, it's a often once in a lifetime experience sometimes for people being able to do something like this. So that's what really makes it worth it. How I got into this. So they had an opening for a job. This was after I'd done the, the zombie game and that was for a finance assistant. It wasn't really me, but I applied for it anyway. Um, and in the interview, they discovered that actually I'm much more creative than I was financial. And they go, oh, um, we didn't actually have an opening for um, a creative assistant, but actually you seem like quite a good fit. So they linked me up with the creative producer and I became her assistant. Um, wasn't even an opening, so it wasn't even a job. Um, and I managed to kind of wiggle my way in. So again, this is a non-traditional way of not necessarily there was a job ad, ad out. I just kind of inquired. I found a little route. I was like, well, it's a job. It's not quite right, but um, I managed to get my way in that way. And then I stayed and I've been there for four years and moved my way up to assistant producer. Um, absolutely love it. It's just really, really sad at the moment that uh, festivals can't go ahead, but I am excited for 2022. So that is Boomtown. Last one is Area 404. Uh, this is an offshoot of Boomtown. This is a venue we bought. It was a warehouse that's in Bristol, uh, in St. Phillips. And it's a 4,000 uh, person capacity warehouse that we've turned into a multi-complex venue for um, events. Um, so this is quite different to the usual what we do at Boomtown, which is in a field, this is, oh, we're now pretty much inside. We've, we've got an actual venue where we can contain everything and we put on something for one night. Um, so that was Area 404. We opened it on uh, Halloween of 2019. Um, and then we, so that was the, the video just watched there. That was very Halloween-y as you could probably tell. We also did a new year event in 2020. And then um, since then also been closed. <laughs> Sadly, but in terms of it's a different style of working in events from working at a festival in a field where um, you kind of have to build almost like a, a city in this field to working at a venue where you build all the infrastructure in the venue. It all stays there. You just, you rig up the lighting, you rig up the staging. Most of it stays there. However, you might have um, some infrastructure coming in and out depending on um, what you need for each show. Um, you, if you're working in a big venue, you'll experience things like cold warehouses that you have to work in. It's usually quite 
grubby. <laughs> it's not glamorous. It can seem glamorous and it's it's really not. Dealing with a lot of tired performers, you've got to be quite energetic, be able to keep them all pepped um, because it can be really tiring doing work like this. Um, but yeah, so a little bit different. In terms of getting it in for that one, I was already at Boomtown. So that's one of the examples if, if you work for an organization um, and um, you might see a project coming up and you go, oh, actually, I feel like I could be quite good for that. It can be, it can give you something else that might be more suitable for you. So I actually took a slightly more senior role in the venue because um, I was like, oh, I really want to do a venue rather than just the big, the big field, the big field. Oh, best thing about venue as well is you can improve a show each time. When you do a festival, it all happens over four days and then, and then that's it. You've got a whole year before you can do it again. I just, it's just nice to be able to iterate a little bit more. Okay. That's the videos, that's the videos. Seamless transition back to slides. Great. Okay. So weird and wonderful world. It's, it's great. Highly recommend. Um, so what else I've been doing, I've been working with aspiring event producers, um, to launch their own events as well. So, um, that's also something I do, um, at Siren Sister College. If there's anybody who's particularly interested in events, I happily work with them and, um, see what route they want to go down because there's a lot going on in that industry. I've launched my own business, um, but I mainly work as a freelancer. You can see me there in a high vis and a radio, generally just probably quite stressed somewhere. Um, mainly worked as a freelancer. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about working freelance because that is um, the bulk of events work really is you'll be working as a freelancer, which means you work for yourself rather than as an employee of an organization. So freelancing, it's increasingly popular. Um, so more and more people do it, especially younger people. They're getting into freelancing quite early on. Um, so in, from the uh, Office for National Statistics, they reported that by December 2019, there were more than 5 million self-employed people in the UK. And that was up from 3.2 million in the year 2000. So it's been going up quite a lot. And in my circle that I'm in, it is majority freelancing so it's really good to just have a good idea of this to see if this is right for you so it means that you are your own boss um which the phrase gets chucked around a lot be your own boss and um but it really does mean you actually do have to be your own boss um and a good boss will set you deadlines uh will motivate you will give you challenges give you training um when you don't have that you have to do that yourself <laughs> no one else is going to do it for you and um, so there are pros and cons definitely to um, being your own boss, as it were. I'm going to just talk through a little bit of the differences so you get um, a good idea. So you're an employee for a company. Um, if you are an employee, say and we're going to go for an example, you're a full time employee, you've got a full time contract. You're probably going to have some stability. You'll probably have a guaranteed and certified income. It's probably going to come in monthly is the norm um, you've got guaranteed and certified work that you'll be given to do you know you probably know what you'll be doing maybe in, in advance and it's going to help with your ability to get a mortgage or a rental contract you might not even be thinking about that now but i can guarantee later on that's going to be something that would be really important to you if you are freelance there is definitely a lack of stability in in the world and you have to kind of embrace it there is no guaranteed income you, if you don't get a job, you will just not have income. And that's kind of the way it is. Um, there is no guaranteed work. Events work often works in kind of a seasonal basis. Um, in particular, if you're thinking festivals, it's very summer seasonal. Um, actually, a lot of events are quite summer seasonal. I think that's kind of um, the, the main element of events is that you can actually often take uh, winter off or people go away and they travel during winter to warmer places and um, if that's the sort of thing that they like to do um i'm quite pale and ginger so i'm i'm fine with british winters for me um other people like to go to hotter places um but yeah there's usually it's quite seasonal work so you won't necessarily be working all of the time um and again can be difficult to secure that mortgage or rental contract i know you won't be thinking this now but trust me 
Um, so if, again, with employment, you're probably going to have some structure and routine. You might have set hours, you might have set days, you might have a set routine. Not always, but most of the time, that, that's generally the way that they'll sort of lay it out. You'll have an, um, the amount of hours you'll be working um, every week will pretty much be set. If you're freelance, this is going to be quite flexible. And I've said it's flexible-ish because, yes, it's flexible when you're a freelancer. You can decide kind of when you're going to get out of bed. Great. Uh, you can kind of dictate the deadlines. This depends on what clients you have and what jobs you're on, because if you're on a job which requires you to actually be at a venue at a certain time, then you just have to be at that venue at a certain time. Um, if you're working with people in other time zones, again, you're going to have to make sure you adapt to that time zone. Um, it could mean a lot of travel. Um, generally, in events, you're going to be traveling a lot. Um, unless you are based in London, you could probably stay and do quite a lot of London events. Otherwise, you're going to be traveling pretty much all over the UK, if not internationally, which might be your bag, might not be. Um, but you need to basically work to your clients. So um, that is something you'll have to be aware of. There won't necessarily be much of a routine. Um, you could be having periods of time where you're working loads, you're really busy, and maybe you have to take job after job after job. You don't have much of a break and just keep on going because you don't know when the next one's going to come. So it can, you can have really busy periods and then periods of nothing. Um, and when you're not working, you'll want to have your own setup. So you want your own desk, you want your own digital setup to organise yourself because when you're freelance, you've got to do all your own admin as well. So you've got to do the paperwork too. Some benefits you get with employment. You get sick pay, holiday, pension, maternity, paternity. I mean, you, should, you might get these. Generally, these are kind of accepted benefits. And um, you might get some overheads covered as well. Um, if, you know, pens and paper at a minimum that they might give you. Um, you freelance, yeah, there's no free perks. No, you cover them all yourself. Um, so whatever you need, you've got to purchase. In events, you're going to need your gaffer tape. You're going to need all your Sharpies. You're probably going to need some tools if you're going to get into maybe rigging up stages. Um, you'll want your own dedicated working space for when you're not um, on site or on location. You'll want somewhere at home where you can like I said, there is paperwork you'll still need to do. So, or, or you need somewhere where you can write your emails, where you're going to try and actually get work. Because when you're not at work, you need to be finding work. So you'll need a computer setup to be able to do that. And you will have to fund all of this. <laughs> um, and just thinking about that sick pay, just so you know, the average person does take off 4.4 days off sick a year. So I know we're thinking, oh, it's fine. But that's 4.4 days that you won't be paid. So... It's just knowing the facts, knowing the facts before you go into it. A few more things, training and development and employment. Uh, you're nurtured to grow. You're often given training opportunities. Um, you might There might be a set career path down that route in that employment. Um, and if you make any mistakes, the um, company will kind of absorb that. Um, and that's okay. Um, in freelance, you do a lot of self-identifying of your own training. So throughout your career, you do not stop learning. I have tried to not stop learning. I will always try and seek out where my weaknesses are and go, okay, I need to learn about that because there will always be things coming up. And what's quite great though, is that you realize as you go down this path that you'll discover different interests and you go, oh, actually, I'm kind of quite interested in rigging up aerial um, equipment so maybe I'll do an aerial rigging course when it's something you hadn't considered before so you can take real control over um, your career path um, and uh, like I said about that niche if you start finding yourself wanting to go down a niche maybe you have a niche of weddings and you're going to really focus on that so maybe you'll focus all your training on being really um, knowledgeable about weddings but again you've got to find the time when to do this block it out yourself and um, you've got to fund the training and if you make any mistakes, again, you'll be covering the costs of that. With employment, you'll have one contract. You work for pretty much one company. They'll probably set the project terms and it does protect you when you have a contract. You'll be working with multiple contracts. You'll be working on multiple projects as a freelancer. So you could be working for the Olympics one day. You could be working for, name another event. Why have I gone blank? There's other events. Uh, football, football, football. Football the next day. <laughs> football. <laughs> um, 
yeah, you can basically, they can be completely varied because also you could work across different types of events as well. You don't have to just do festivals, football, football shows. They're not called shows. You can tell I don't work. I've never worked with football. Um, but you'll have lots of contracts. Um, a couple of tips would be interrogate every line. Really, really important because they're written by lots of different people. So make sure you read your contracts. Um, you can maybe set your own contract terms if you like. Um, and everything will be in writing. And that's where you've got to be really careful in terms of what you agree to. That's a bit of extra stuff. When you're employed, you've got a regular team, a regular team that's going to build a support network with. You'll see them every day, which can be really nice. You can develop some great relationships. You're part of the community when you're employed. Uh, freelance, you will spend um, quite a bit of time on your own, although you wouldn't necessarily realise it because you um, are going to be working a lot on these events with lots of other people. But when you're not working, you'll be on your own. Um, you'll move on to different projects to projects. And every time you work on a project, you will form amazing friendships because that is definitely one of the best things about working in events is the bonds I've made with every single person that I work with. Um, you work really closely because you also go through um, a lot together. So you form amazing friendships, but then you move on to the next gig and then you might not see them again for years. Um, and that can be quite hard because um, sometimes you'll work, get onto the next gig and maybe the people aren't, you don't quite gel with as well. And it's just like, oh, it wasn't quite like the last one, but then maybe the next one. So you form loads of different um, friendships with people all over the world, which is amazing. Um, sometimes maintaining those friendships though can be difficult. Um, and then you'll have to put in the effort to be part of the community, the um, events community itself. So it, that's, there is definite perks in that. My last point is about switching off um, with employment. Again, not always. A lot of teachers end up working quite late. They'll be working on weekends, doing marking and things like that. However, generally with employment, you've got set hours. When you leave work, you leave your work at work management can take over if anything happens you can kind of separate yourself if you sign up for the freelance life your work and your life will get a little bit blurry um so that's why people who often work in events are really passionate about them because it's going to end up being a huge part of your life you'll work all odd hours like i mentioned you could do multiple gigs in a row um and then none at all you're probably always thinking about it what's the next job and if you need to time off you have to schedule it because um, otherwise it might not happen and you don't want to risk getting burned out. This may seem like this, all this stuff would never happen, but these are really useful things to go know going into the industry because I've met lots of people who have gone into this and realised it's really not for them because of how hmm, rocky it is, I guess. But I love it. I love being part of this community. There are so many perks and I feel like it's be, it's created this incredible experience and path that I've been down. So um, um, I hope I haven't painted too much of a bad picture. It's just a few heads up on that. Let's move on, let's move on. So how did I get to where I am? So when I was about your age, I just loved kind of performancey stuff. I loved drama. I liked art. I didn't have a real career path. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, and um, uh, I got my A-levels and then was just clueless. So I joined a circus, which was a really on the whim, random thing to do. But there happened to be one in town and um, I managed to uh, somehow just get in. So um I won't go into it, but I joined a circus and that was a really good thing for me to do, to just try something really different. So if you're really um, unsure of what to do, try something really odd. <laughs> try something really odd and maybe it'll kind of open your mind. And it really did for me because I joined the circus and I realised how much I liked working behind the scenes and in kind of in production. And I liked kind of helping run the show rather than be in the show so I kind of was like ah, oh, okay I think I'm I think I'm a production person um I then actually ended up studying film production and that's what I did my degree in because I really I started filming documentaries at the circus so I was like oh maybe I'm film production um I start I then went on to moving on to film sets and tv sets um but I really which was good but I really missed the live element of um shows of theatre, of circus, I kind of missed that live element. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll do some volunteering for events because I think I'm missing it. So I volunteered at lots of events um, and then I even set up my own club night. Uh, this is when I was living in Glasgow. 
Um, and as I was doing more and more of it, I realized, oh, I think this is my, I think this is my thing. Um, and um, I realized I, I quite liked um, at the club night to do kind of um, as many kind of um, crazy circusy stuff as we possibly could try. And I started to find my niche of the, the weird events, I guess. And then I got my first gig with 2.8 and then the rest is the rest as you saw the rest really. So that's how I got there. It was not a straightforward path. Um, I didn't plan it. Um, I just followed my passions at each point and invested every time I got to every, every roadmark I got to. I wasn't really thinking necessarily about the next thing. I just really chucked everything that I had at what I currently had and naturally things just happened. So you might want to have a set route. You might want to just see, see where things go. That's what I did, um, and I don't have any regrets. What do we mean by events? I've been talking about events, and I've we've talked about football um, and Olympics. We didn't talk about many others, but I just want to mention that when I say events, I am meaning loads of different types, cultural celebrations, business and trade, arts and entertainment, sports and recreation, political and state, private functions. It can mean so many different things and that's why events can also work across different sectors which is quite nice because then you can see such a big range because um, a political function like a political event will be so different to something like oh, some of the um, arts events that you'll work on so it's nice you get to you get a really good broad range of things that you get to be part of or you pick a niche and you can go I want to do that's where I go blank again conferences on about IT. To uh, organise all the college open events and graduation ceremonies and all those kind of things in my old thank role. You, yes, yeah. thank you. Oh, I need an input when I go blank. So if you can just be <laughs> on standby <laughs> with examples, that would be great. Better, um, than, better, than my, better than mine, Joe. <laughs> Sophie's going to kill I me. I mean, I like football as well. So. <laughs> <sighs> Now it is obviously the people that make events um, and um, I've been talking about my experience but I want to talk about all the different types of roles you get in events uh, because there is a range of roles it's not just event manager which is a role. Um, sure all of these people here are completely valuable and needed for the event. This was um, a photo I mean, bonus points if you can spot me in here. This is when we opened Aereo 404 um, uh, this was the day of, of opening the Halloween event. Definitely hadn't slept for about three days when that had opened. So luckily you can't see my face very well. Moving on. So let me just talk you through. I thought what I'll do is I'll go through the different roles we have at Boomtown as a good example to kind of give you a good idea of how different the roles are, because maybe you are like, oh, I don't want to be an event manager. Don't have to be. There's lots of other different ways you could work in events. So we obviously got the bosses. You've got the boss. We've got the visionaries, there are, we've got two bosses. One is very kind of commercially driven, understands the finances, the business. We've got one who's very creatively driven. So has, a, has the kind of the crazy, insane vision that we somehow have to try and always match each year. Um, it's good fun, but we've got the bosses who kind of lead the ship. So maybe you're gonna be a boss. Maybe you work in the creative team like I do. So in the creative team, we, um, uh, deal with all the performers, the stages. We've got a storyline at Boomtown, but that's quite niche. Um, we've got uh, loads of different types of shows, big spectacles, things like that. Um, and you've got to make sure that the ent entertainment is engaging the audience that's there. You want to gather people at certain locations, make sure they stay there, having a good time, and you want them to feel connected to the brand of Boomtown. Next one we've got is music. You could be part of the music team. They book artists, they negotiate deals with, our, uh, with agents. They deal with all the crazy rider requests. Um, you can probably, if you can, if you can dream it, it's been requested as a rider. Um, what was the last really weird one? Like it was like a hundred fresh oysters or something. I was like, oh, what, a festival, how? Um, but there's been so many strange ones. You've probably heard the stories about um, only a bowl of blue M&Ms. They can be very specific. Um, but they've got to book uh, what the audience there wants to see. So that is actually their challenge because they want to manage the crowd flow of different stages. So 
it, they'll plan, they want some stages to be busier than others. And that's why probably when you've ever gone to a music event, um, you've, you've probably noticed that actually at the most popular stages it's not too full because they've programmed it in a way that they'll nicely disperse people at different stages it's a very complex juggling act that they have to do um as, and making sure there aren't stages that are just really quiet and not and no one there so they have to be really hot and knowing what people want communications so toby was talking a bit about working in comms so in this department they do all the marketing social media putting together graphics all the videos, we just watched one of the beautiful videos earlier of the after film. Um, so they have a whole team that works on that. They have to speak to local press um, to put their press releases out and um, paint the image of Boomtown. They have to put, do really clear messaging so people understand what we do and um, how we want to come across in the world. They also have to be there when we're going through really difficult things. I mentioned we had a hurricane one time and they had to communicate to the outside world how that was going. Um, there have also been things like uh, fires in the car park. There have also unfortunately been deaths. So it's not always easy being in the comms team because um, you sometimes have to deal with um, the difficult situations that happen in your organization and formulate the best way in that you're gonna communicate them. So um, it's not necessarily just nice pictures of people dancing. Got a legal team, legal team deal with all the contracts, any legal complaints that come in. I've got to make sure we abide by the law and help us with any sticky situations. So, you know, maybe that'd be more your thing. <laughs> um, finance team, all things money. They help us get funding. They help us with human resources. Um, it costs millions of pounds to put on a festival and budgets are always very, very tight. So they are in control of the money. They decide who gets what, where the money is needed and they have total control of the budget um because it's their responsibility to ensure that the festival hopefully makes profit at the very least doesn't go into debt that's and that is their they're in total control of that um so they're making sure we as a department any departments don't go over budget we've got a few more but you didn't think there were this many eh um commercial so we've got sponsorships so you might have ever seen some um banners billboards or bars set up by certain sponsors they deal with loads of traders we have um loads of traders come in selling um food and merchandise and clothing and lots of things so they set up all the contracts and deals with them um and they make sure that they ensure there's a good business relationship with anybody we commercially work with Production, this team, they build, they build stages, they build crazy infrastructure, they build site art, they sweat all the lighting. It's a lot of being uh, rigged up on sets is this one and trying to figure out where all the scaff is gonna go and doing lots of design plans. So maybe if you've ever done any architectural drawings or things like that, this could be a route for you if you find yourself liking to draw um, any building structures, figuring out, making sure things aren't gonna just fall over in the wind because everything at Boomtown is a set it's not real but it has to be structurally sound and then we've got the site team they deal with everything in terms of power water toilets the overall running of the site because if you work in a site team um, at a festival that uh, is just a green field <laughs> with nothing in it but you basically have to build the entire infrastructure of a, basically a mini city from scratch and it's they're so important because the water has to be clean no one can get ill we need power to run all the lighting um to run the catering they need power um so it's actually one of the most important jobs on site um, and then finally, we have ops, the operations team. Um, they work with the council to make sure that the council are happy with everything that we're doing. And we um, have made kind of agreements with them. They work with the emergency services. They create emergency plans, um, like ev evacuation plans. Um, they organize all the vehicle movement throughout site, all the crowd management and security. Um, so again, very, very, very important job, this one because um, they'll be dealing with all of the all of the big problems if you work in the ops team what do we all have in common we all do far more health and safety than you'd realize so if you work in events just so you know there's a lot of work that goes into health and safety i work in the creative team and about 80 percent of my job is around health and safety 
it's around making risk assessments. It's around making sure everything happens safely. So it can seem really kind of fun. We're just booking loads of circus performers and all of that. But I do want to stress there's a lot of uh, spreadsheets. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of health and safety that actually goes behind it to make what looks quite um, a risky event actually be very, very safe. So, oh, and just so you know, there's about 30 people that work in the headquarters of Boomtown, but we have about 5,000 people that join us on site as our crew. Um, so that's actually quite a lot of people. So that was what was really sad about the cancellation of Boomtown that we had to announce yesterday is that it's not just the people who work, work in HQ, it's actually, there's a whole community of people who work for festivals. That's 5,000 people who won't be able to work this year at, at Boomtown and probably many other festivals that inevitably are going to cancel. Um, right, shimmy on. Just wanna quickly talk about the phases of an event because we often think of uh, an event once we're there, but there's actually a few different phases. You've obviously got pre-event, the event, after the event. Just to interrupt a sec, we've probably got a, just about 10 minutes left Okay. Um, including questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I'm going to shimmy on past this. Yeah. Just I go. If you wanted to, and we can pass on any other any forms. We can um, send it as attachments to emails or so. Yeah. I don't know. If That's fine. I just want to say that there's five phases. You've got initiation. You've got planning. The biggest one. Implementing, getting everybody on site. The staging actually happening and then the closing process so just so you know the last bit that i wanted to do this should be quite quick we're going to try and maybe build an event we could try this now or do you want to just shimmy on to questions because i was going to try this this was an absolute wild card if this would even work <laughs> I think we'll try it it'll be we'll try it. and wake everybody up wake them all and get them all excited for the, the um questions at the end <laughs> right i'm going to give this a whirl okay so question one uh, you now know everything about events, so we're going to go for it. You're going to build one. Um, why are you putting on this event? I want you to pick your answer. Of why, would, why would you want to put on this event? Is it A, to teach people how to do something? Is it B, to entertain people with something? Um, or to uh, for C, to convince people to change their behaviour? Please pick a reason why you'd want to put on your event. Mm -hmm. We've got people voting. Can you see the polls, Sophie, or not? I can see the questions news. and answers, but I can't see any results. Okay, I'll read that. So most people are looking at, yeah, that's over 88% are looking at to entertain people. So they uh, want to entertain people. Right, okay. So the reason why I asked you this is because we always start with why. Any event you do, you have to have a purpose, you have to have a why, it gives us a direction. We can then measure our success, whether we actually achieved it. Um, and it keeps us grounded all the way through when the going gets tough, why are we doing it? So we're doing this event because we want to entertain people. Okay, cool. Next question. What type of event will it be then? Is it gonna be an arts and entertainment event? Or will it be a sports and recreation event? Pick the type. Oh, looks like most people are going for, actually all of them have gone for arts and entertainment. Have they now? Okay. Well, congratulations. And that means you've chosen the Discover Your Inner Artist Festival. I'm going to skip past quickly the other ones that it could have been. Go, 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 go. You could have had Dog Olympics. You really missed out, guys. Oh, <laughs> oh you chose wrong. Um, so yeah, you've chosen the Discover Your Inner Artist Festival. Oh no, you haven't. You haven't. I've picked the wrong one. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was actually the multi-genre concert. Multi-genre concert is what you guys are because we're entertaining and our um, actual type of event is arts entertainment. So that's what it was. Third question. Who's it for? Is it for you? Young people? Is it for your teachers? Adults? Adults could be just at any age really, I guess. We're 18 plus. Young people will get will say is we're just we're just going to be quite vague with what young means. <laughs> you look young. <laughs> we don't have that poll, I'm afraid, Sophie. We've got okay. Uh, just tap it into the chat, people, and then we'll have a look. Sorry, I haven't got that. And I'll have a look. See what you're all typing the most. Uh, looks oh, a mixture one for adult. Mainly young people. Mainly young Some people. Some want to do both. Some want to include both people, both uh, young and adults. Okay. 
Let's but I'd back. say majority are going for young people. A thousand people. percent, somebody said, just for young oh, people. I see. Okay. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> We're going to push this at kind of more young people than just anyone generally young people okay that's because we need to target our audience so we know we're going to go young people it's a multi-genre concert uh, and we're there to entertain them we've got to engage them that's often with our marketing we've got to engage them before the event and whilst we're there making sure like i said get the right program the right music we've got to make sure it's music that they're actually going to want to see they're not going to turn up and be really disappointed um we've got to manage their expectations so how much are we going to tell them are we going to keep it a real secret or are we going to um, tell them exactly what's going to happen and therefore if it doesn't meet their expectations they won't be very happy or do we keep it a secret and then they turn up and it's still not what they like how are we going to do that so that's some questions and we've got to manage audience behavior young people you can be uh, we can we just don't know it can be, it could be anything so how are we going to manage your behavior if you're going to get a bit too aggressive maybe we're going to need some security if you get a bit hyper maybe you need a way to calm you down um so how are we going to how are we going to manage people if people get a bit bit pepped up so let's think what type of audience we have question four when will your event be would it be daytime in july nighttime in july daytime in december or nighttime in december essentially we've got a summer or winter situation and is it day or night most people are going for the summer summer okay but uh, oh, it's quite quite close as to whether it's day or night. But I think night just winning out. Yeah, just so night time in July we've gone for. Night time in July. Okay, cool. So we've got multi genre concert. Night time in July. So we're going summer night, summer evening. Okay, cool. So certain events can be linked to certain times of the year. You know, festival seasons. Um uh is about june to august um and then we've got uh winter usually becomes a bit more christmasy if you've heard of things like black friday that can obviously be a big push you know certain things can be linked to certain days or certain times um but no matter what we're gonna have to prepare for all weathers we're in britain it can be any weather um even in the summer even in the summer i'm afraid so it if we have sun, so maybe it's just before before the sun sets. We have sun, that would be that would be good, right? People are in a positive mood. Um, it can also be a bit bad if it's too hot. You're going to get people with sunburn, so we might need some medical team there. Um, uh, we could get people who'd be dehydrated, so we're going to need some water stations. We're going to need to set up some shade somewhere. We're going to need supplies if people are overheating. Um, people often arrive earlier if it's sunny. And um, there can be a lot of dust as well. So, and that can be an absolute nightmare to get rid of it and can be really bad for people with asthma. So sometimes sun is good. Ideally, we want it to be a bit cooler so people don't get too carried away. Um, if we've got rain, oh, we're going to need shelter because people hate standing in the rain, obviously. People might not turn up. Um, we're going to need to make sure all our tech is waterproof, just there things to cover all of our technical equipment. We're going to need ponchos. People might have umbrellas. If they've got an umbrella, it might block someone's view of the concert. Um, could be used as a weapon as well, you know. Like I did say, we need to manage this behaviour. Someone could get angry. Um, there might be slips and trips. Um, maybe staff won't even turn up if it's going to rain. So we need to get some wood chips on the ground in case it gets really muddy so people can still walk and everything. And everything will probably move a bit slower. So there might be some more cues, maybe some hypothermia. It's all to play for really, isn't it really? Um, ice and snow, again, more, more falls. We're going to need a lot of heaters to make sure people are happy. Um, we need a snow plow, potentially. That's going to be expensive, isn't it, to get that in. Wind is probably the hardest one to deal with, actually, out of all of them, because uh, wind is actually going to really ruin our sound. If we're doing a concert, we've got wind, it's going to be a nightmare. And if you've got any tents, they're going to go flying. I so lost a marquee at the Bristol Balloon Fiesta when I was working there at an event. Yeah. Oh, no. There was a fair few of them got lost on the same night. They just all blew away. Oh, <laughs> rest in peace. Um, <laughs> It's also going to be a nightmare if we have any pyrotechnics planned. If we've got some fireworks going off and it's really windy, it's not going to go well. Um, so that's we've considered that. So we've got all that out of the way. Last question. Where is it going to be? Is it going to be an empty venue uh, or a green field? So this is what your, this is what your venue looks like. It's empty warehouse. Nothing in it. Or green field. Don't think we have this one as a poll either. So if you want to type it into the chat box. Oh, we do have it. There you go. 
I died. Fancy warehouse or greenfield? Oh. Oh, oh, it's swapping. Oh. Somebody else needs to vote. We're literally 50 50. Oh, what no, gone? Done it. Well, uh, empty warehouse. Empty has warehouse. Out just. Okay. That's because <laughs> like I scared vote. you with the weather, wasn't it? That's what happened. So we need to consider our accessibility. How are we going to get people into that warehouse? How will they get there? Is it out in the sticks? Um, especially if we need to consider people in wheelchairs, anything like that. Is the ground okay? Is it available? Is it available to us? Will anybody else need it straight after us? So we need to make sure we clear out real quick. What about the flow of people and crowd control? We've got a warehouse. We've got to make sure people are moving safely within it so we don't cause any crushing anywhere. So that's really important to know our layout. How much is it going to cost? If it's a flashy warehouse, it might cost us a lot. If it's a bit more derelict, it might not cost us that much, but then might cost us more to actually fill it out with things to make sure it's safe for people to be actually um, to be able to be in there. How attractive, how much will it cost to make it attractive? You know, it looks a bit rubbish right now. There's nothing in it. We're gonna have to fill it with loads of stuff to make it actually look really good. So if anyone's bought any tickets, they're actually gonna like it. So we've got to make it look attractive and appealing. What's the capacity like? Um, how, how are we gonna manage it? You know, what if we get more people turning up than we want? It's like when you put on a house party and it turns out everyone from your school shows up and you weren't prepared for that at all. Again, how are you gonna manage capacity here? Safety and security. We've got to manage your security again like i did say some people they're just going to get a bit angry it always happens so how are you going to make sure people are safe when they're there will they have access to a medical team can the ambulance get there is there parking we're going to need parking because some people are going to drive aren't they so we've got to make sure there's some parking nearby if there isn't parking at the venue is there parking nearby can we put some on-site facilities oh there's no working toilets we'll have to bring in some portaloos won't we we have to bring in some running uh, clean water um we'll have to actually build it all from scratch if there's nothing in there so we're gonna have to build that we're gonna need some staff we need some staff to fill this place because we're gonna need some help to actually run this thing um gotta make sure we don't put too much impact on the environment so not too much noise pollution let's not ruin the ground um we want to do everything with minimize as much minimal impact on the environment as possible can we store anything anywhere that would be really helpful we've got some quite big bits of set for our uh, multi-genre concert we need to put somewhere so have we got anywhere to store it we've got to make sure it's really hygienic and clean because people are going to be using those toilets and um we want to make sure there hasn't been any kind of rats there or anything or anything that could be um people could pick up something kind of horrible if they cut themselves or there might be some legal considerations i mean right now it's technically illegal to even put on an event so i mean yeah we need to consider that need some visibility and signage how will people find it once they're in how will they know where to go we need to create some signage how do we map that out and do we have any technical facilities ways that we can put our rig up our sound our visuals we're going to need all of that in there we need an evacuation plan what if there's a fire and we're going to need a backup location because overall it could just go it could be taken away from us at any moment because that always happens generally with events is something's going to go quite often it's the venue that is the end of your event well done for considering all those things you've now got your multi-genre concert that you can now run um along with all these considerations of course um and you've got a team that you can work with um i'm happy for you guys to just send out the oh, um yeah. slides at the end because i've just got some tips at the end yeah, brilliant like, thank you better. sophie i just didn't i used to organize events but on a much smaller scale and i didn't realize there was so many different elements and staff that work there yeah so a couple of questions coming in the first one's for toby um i think you answered it but if you can answer it in the chat what qualifications do i need to get an apprentice creative apprenticeship uh, uh, so it's employer dependent. It doesn't, you don't actually need any, um, so you don't need any, uh, mandatory qualifications, but obviously the more that you've got, the better. So some employers will ask for a range of, maybe they'll want five GCSEs, maybe they want two, maybe they want three, etc. So probably it's, it's a bit of a gray area, but I'd probably say the best grade you could possibly get. And then if you're moving into the creative sector, um, or you want to get a, an apprenticeship in the creative sector, so video, photography, kind of the ones I was kind of saying, um, you're probably going to need yourself a personal portfolio of creative um, creations. So maybe your own YouTube channel, maybe your own uh, video portfolio of stuff that you've done. Um, it can just be of you skateboarding with your mates. It can be of you doing fashion videos. It can be of you doing 
stuff at home it doesn't have to be anything work related but it just shows passion and commitment that's what most employers will be um looking for so personal commitment and passion really will will get you further than having a a star in history or a star in maths uh, yeah. thank you toby that's really helpful uh one for you sophie um do, do you need to go to university um to do your kind of job and what kind of thing can you study I mean, what course would you study if you did go to university? So you don't have to go to university um, generally to just get started in events. Um, I would recommend if you're interested, just try volunteering and see if it's for you. Um, if you did want to go to university and you want to get very specifically into events management, there are events management courses, which are fantastic. Um, but I just wanted to also mention that there are so many different types of roles within an event. Um, so, you know, you have your legal team, your finance team. So you could end up going down maybe... Um, you know, if you wanted to go into finance, you could go down the financial route and actually study finance, but then end up still working in events. Um, you would not not get a job generally in events without um, with a certain qualification, um, unless you were going down um, something a bit more like um, if you wanted to work in the legal team, then I think you'd need um, a, um, to study law. But generally in other events, you can kind of study anything um, quite creative, I think would be absolutely fine. But there's no prerequisite. Everyone finds their way in their own kind of path. Thank you. Um, somebody wants to know how much like money a festival would make. So like Boomtown, for example, does that make a lot of money or is it more about breaking even or...? Uh, festivals generally aren't um, very profitable businesses to run. Um, they don't, they're not big money makers. Um, so um, heads up if anybody was thinking of running one. Um, so Boomtown um, mainly just breaks even. They are an independent festival though. And uh, most independent festivals don't really make a profit. Um, and that is because um, in the festival scene, at least in the UK, um, They've kind of been bought up by Live Nation, who own the monopoly of festivals. And um, so they are kind of, they own um, most of them. So your Creamfields, your Wireless, your Reading, your Leeds. Um, so they make a profit because they have many of them. The independent ones generally don't really make a profit. Okay. Uh, there's a question, I think, probably for you, Toby. Um, do you need specific grades or... A levels to do things like film production or creativity. Uh, do you know the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you, uh, so, do I need? Do you need any specific grades? Would yeah, or a, or A levels. Is there any A levels you might need to do? Uh, you don't need any specific grades as such. There's no prerequisite to have a specific grade. Um, uh, obviously, if you've got a most, it's down to the employer again. And they would pick um, from a from obviously it's like they'd apply they put out a job advert so people would apply, and so think about it and you're in a mix of twenty to thirty applicants and then who looks best on a piece of paper, so if you've got some good grades in um, let's say you're going for a photography apprenticeship if you've got a A level in photography that's going to really pay dividends against someone who's got no A level in photography. Um, so it does, it's not mandatory you have to have one, but if you have, it really does help. And most employers generally will say if they get in someone for video, they'll want someone that's done a media course and they've got a very good grade in it. Um, so for example, we've got a job ad out at the moment with someone and they're not so worried too much about English, math, science, history, all those bits and pieces, as long as English and maths are at okay level. What they want is someone that's got a distinction star in media so at college level so that's what they're asking for on that one and then i've got another one asking for who is working in the communications who is asking for a very high level of english so they need a very good level of english to do that so i don't know if that helps paint a couple of pictures there thank you i've got two more questions one for you toby and then the last one for you sophie um quick one is do graphic design apprenticeships exist uh yes yes they do Yes, they do. Yeah. There's, there's, there's two. There's one called Junior Content Producer, which is a very wide ranging one, which I can give some links to. And, and they are uh, currently uh, de defining and developing a, a specific uh, graphic design um, apprenticeship. So, yes. Cool. And then fi the final one is for you, Sophie, is about um, performance. So um, are there things as like freelance performers and 
can they they work in events as well oh yes absolutely um so in terms of freelance performance um it is it is really good to go down um uh, and try and get some um edu like education in in performance I've, i'd really recommend that um so drama courses and things like that um and then if you're going to go your most performers are then again also they'll they're freelance so you're basically you look for auditions and opportunities that are posted on a variety of job sites so you do a lot of the work yourself in finding work and applying for these things and these can be video auditions they can be physical auditions um uh, they can be open calls so you will then have to find all the networks yourself to get yourself seen for all of these different potential jobs that you could then get booked for perfect thank you sophie I, and thank you, Toby. Yeah, that was really great. And yeah, we'll send on the presentation and the bits that we have to skip over to um, the students. Um, so just to quickly finish off, um, so next week um, is going to be the fifth uh, session um, and it's going to be theatre performance. So that's going to be run by Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. Um, they're going to give you course information, career options, um, and they're also going to do a demo on how they do set design, um, which is how they do it mock it up really small in like a shoebox. So they're going to show you how they do kind of set design in a shoebox. Um, so they'll demonstrate that on screen. Um, and then the following week is the last session will be on um, music tech um, by Create Access Creative College. Um, if you guys don't mind just saying very quickly. We'll